So um, just a quick couple minutes of introduction um, for those of you I haven't met yet. Uh, my name is Jason Smith. Um, I am the current product manager, which means I manage the current products, which may kind of, yeah, makes sense. Um, in addition, uh, my job is to make sure that new products introduce correctly, that current products stay on the shelves when they're on the shelf or are available, and then lastly, that products end their lives correctly as well, so that they roll out nice and cleanly. Um, also, though, I deal with uh, any issues that might come up, like, say, I don't know, 20B keyboard issues, things of that nature. So my job is to also deal with that. Or packaging issues, when there's a misprint on the package, I, you know, when you guys let me know about that, then I get to go and fix that. So uh, I also handle the web stuff. So when that's a total mess, you guys can let me know, and I'll help get that resolved as well. So in any case, that's what I do in a quick nutshell. Um, I did up until very recently do this, exam certification and approval, and that's what I'm going to talk about today. Um, my colleague, and I'm sorry I'm talking so fast, my colleague Laura Herrich will be coming in here in a little while, um, and she'll actually be taking this over from me, but I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the process we've defined to do this. Um, I had spent about six months starting to pick this up again. This <coughs> process overall had really fallen through the cracks with regards to pushing for further approval on exams and certifications. So we'll talk about that, um, but really the goal for me today is to get from you what you feel appropriate exams and good places to be for HPR. And you can also ask questions like, why the heck aren't we on this exam? Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about why we prioritize the way we do, what we do once we have prioritized, and how we go forward. So uh, any questions so far? No. Yes, Richard. Well, I may be premature, but uh, one year it was something, I forgot what it was now, about three or four years ago, it was uh -huh. something very controversial. And I kind of got in the middle. I, okay. I jumped in the middle of a lifetime. Okay. And, and, and I, I learned a little bit about the process. Great. And uh, I can see where that can take a lot of time. Okay, great. So Richard's comment was basically that he, you know, he'd been involved with this a couple years ago and had seen how the process could take a lot of time. And the process has likely changed because I sort of picked it up from no one, really. It was sort of laying on the ground, forlorn and sad. And so I picked it up and sort of defined the process myself. So I'd love your feedback today as well on whether you think the process makes sense. So are we doing that um, kids taking exams in high school? Can you repeat that, please? Are we talking about kids taking exams? Yeah, are we talking about kids taking exams in high schools? Yes, we're talking about just about any exam that you might take with a calculator, so that can be SAT, ACT, et cetera, but also it, it extends to certification exams like the FE or PE or things like that. So we'll, we're, it spans the gamut. Um, today's going to be non-specific, so um, you know, we'll talk about all of those things. And actually, I'll give you a little more detail as, as I've learned about how one gets certified for these exams and some of the observations I've had. Um, so this is essentially the process. Um, I've tried to keep it very simple because obviously simple is a lot easier to understand. Um, it starts at the top, but it obviously it's circular so it can go in any pattern. But the funnel is essentially the suggestions we get from BDMs, in this case is our business development managers. We have one per region, EMEA, North America, <coughs> Latin America, and Asia Pacific. And they are one avenue that we get recommendations for <coughs> we'd like to be part of this exam. And they take suggestions from you guys, from their retail resellers, and others. Uh, in addition, though, you see there's educators up here and professionals. So really, what I'm trying to say here is that we get feedback from everyone. And, and in addition, though, this group is a, an ex excellent resource for us for suggestions, which is exactly why I'm here today for many other reasons as well. But I'd like to hear your suggestions as to what you feel are appropriate exams or things that you wish we would do. Um, once a once we are, we've got things in the funnel, then it comes down to the process side here. And what that means is that basically we talk about how we qualify the exam itself. So do we go after it, do we not? Do we really actively pursue it, or do we just sort of lay back and let it happen? Um, and it kind of depends on the exam as to how we do that. And I'll talk a bit more about that in a second. Um, and then lastly is acting, and this is really where we go out and either you know, really try to get as a part of the exam, or we just promote it on our packaging, depending. And sometimes it's both, sometimes it's one or the other. Okay? Make sense? Any questions on that so far? We'll go into further detail about each of these things, so uh, I, won't, I won't dwell on this, this graphic. Um, so again, really here, the, the inputs we receive are from a host of people, and there really are a lot of recommendations out there, and everyone, as you probably know, has an opinion on what should and shouldn't be included. Um, parents, by and large, tend to really care about like SAT and ACT, or advanced prep courses in the US. Um, but, but again, people who are in the industry, professionals, might care a lot more about their specific certification, whether it's FE or PE, whether it's CFA, the C, uh, CFP, there's a ton of different certifications, and I have a list just after this slide that shows the ones that we care about today. 
um, which we obviously will change dynamically as we go. Um, we qualify today on these kinds of criteria. So basically the size of the exam itself, to whom it's delivered, is it a big set of folks? Is it a small set of folks? Um, how often is it delivered? What is the uh, frequency of the exam? And how open, and this is sort of a subjective gauge, but how open is that exam to uh, new additions of calculators? So um, some exams, like I'll give you an example of the CFA, the Certified Financial Analyst Exam. Um, I went to go meet with them, gosh, it was I think, like a week or two after I started that job. Um, and uh, I met with them and they said, you know what, we don't, we've never actually reviewed calculators before to add new ones. They allow two calculators today. They allow the, the one TI and one HP, the 12C and the TA, I want to say, TI, I don't remember what it is, but uh, which one? BA2+. Plus. BA2+. Plus. I didn't actually want to say it out loud, but it's all right. Thank you, Tim, for helping me out there. Um, in any case, uh, they allow two calculators and two calculators only-ish, you know, we'll say 12C family. But we were encouraging them greatly to, you know, can you include like a 10B2 or a 17B2+. Plus? And they said, you know, I don't think so. We're not really open to adding anymore. And their justification was a, a valid one in the sense that they're a worldwide distributed exam, which is exactly why we want to be part of it, right? Because it's a huge exam. And yet, they have some real challenges in making sure people are bringing the right calculator into the exam. So their openness is very limited. Richard. And the right calculator, the big issue I, I keep hearing is that they're worried that you're going to take something out of the exam. That's correct. Now, I would think that people like... Well, I'm thinking objectively, and I know you're talking about sure. people. No, that's fine. Possible, but yeah. I would think that the right way to do an exam is you do the same exam once a year, and you don't care because next year it's a totally different exam. Yes. Now, let me tell you a little bit about that. And so Richard's point was that, and this is actually something I realized and didn't think about before I talked to both these guys, as well as the NCWES, which do the uh, FE and PE exams. What I keep hearing sort of consistently throughout these exams is not so much what students are bringing in, but more what they're taking out or able to take with them. Um, and that's why there's restrictions on QWERTY keyboards and touch screens and things like this, because they don't want students to take the exam with them. And Richard's point was, what if we were just to give one exam this year and next year a completely different exam? What I learned was that there's a thing called time-based cheating, where uh, they give an FE exam at the same time, right? But in the, in, in the East Coast, they deliver the exam three hours before they're four hours before they go in the West Coast. Right? So is this an exam, so this is what happened actually. There was a student in the exam on the East Coast who was putting in all the answers and sending it via Bluetooth to a person just outside the wall. And that person then relayed it to the West Coast and they sold those answers three hours in advance of the exam. Okay? Now obviously that's a very uh, corner case, but at the same time it gives you an idea of exactly the sensitivity of this information. And, and if you think about it as a global exam, that obviously becomes even more of an issue, right? So someone takes it in Australia, and by the time I wake up in the U.S., I've got my answers to that exam. <coughs> Sorry, there's a question back. Yeah, just a, a quick point. So did you, if you try to approach the subject of today about taking things out, you can do that with eyeglasses, you can do that with a pen. With the oh, yeah, absolutely. So watch <coughs> your point was, yeah, can, people can take things out with a whole bunch of other devices as well. And you're absolutely right about that. They were talking about, they, and it's funny to talk to these folks about this because they've got so many great war stories. So a woman who had uh, a PDA embedded in her jacket and actually had it run up to a camera that was in her sleeve so she could look like this. But I've heard stories of people taking a 12C calculator and drilling a hole and embedding a calculator in there. So you're absolutely right. There are a million ways to cheat. I think their goal is to both limit the number of devices that are possible to use in that scenario. So like, for instance, the CFA, I believe it is today, gives you a pencil when you come in as an example, right? <laughs> and, and I can see the case for giving you a calculator, too, and I think Tim had a point. You know the story behind the pencil? No, you want to give us a story uh, about the, the pencil? The same is that time-based cheating they, they send the answers and bet them on the side of the pencil. Ah. A, B, C, D, E, F. I see. For the, all the answers. So they embed the answers on the pencil itself. So I mean, it is no, so no question that cheaters will always be a little bit, it's sort of like drug wars, right? Cops are always one step behind the mafioso in getting you know, the new weapons. I think the same thing here. Cheaters are going to be always one step ahead. I think the point I'm trying to make here is that exam boards, by and large, security folks within those organizations in particular, are really reluctant to add anything new to the mix because it just makes it more difficult for them to monitor. OK? So that's the uphill battle we tend to fight. Please. So, and you may talk about this, and I think you just hinted at it, but it seems like an easy answer is, you know, make a deal with these exam agencies and say, if you let the 10B2 
and right. there. We'll give you all of them. Right, right. And then, so the point was, how, how could we find a way to work with these exam boards to provide the calculator to them? Right. And I think that's a really great point, and that's actually one I kind of come to. So there's a few things that come out of this, and I don't want to dwell on it too much, but a few ideas I've had about how we can improve our products to really meet with their needs. Um, yesterday's, oh, sorry, I'll get right to you. Um, yesterday's discussion, we talked, somebody was mentioning adding Bluetooth to like the 27, I think it was Gene that was mentioning, you know, don't assume we're going to add all these things because it'll limit us. That's one aspect of product development that we need to consider. But in addition, we can think about how can we add, say, I don't know, tamper-proof, tamper-evident tags, for instance, to our products to say, okay, this is locked down. There's no way somebody to open this and reclose it with some other device in. And uh, sorry, go ahead and. and uh, give me your you were talking about that light, uh, selling to the testing organization mm -hmm. the calculator. Yes. The I understand the NSA or somebody on that level. What they had their policy was is you can bring anything into the facility you want but nothing ever leaves again so if you want to have your <laughs> that's MP3, a really good idea your cd player your yeah CD, yeah CD player, it's fine. bring anything you, you like in but, but nothing ever leaves nothing the place ever leaves. okay and that that you guess what you said you get those things put temper tabs they can put temper tabs right. over everything right hand them out collect them again right and it's a selling point for you if absolutely you can, uh, provide the total security. Yeah, no, absolutely. So so basically what it's led to is a bit of a, um, an epiphany for me, and uh, being new, I, you know, I've, there's a lot of those happening lately, but um, in this case, it's been really good to say, okay, how do we incorporate this into our product development? So a couple, so let me, and I'm gonna give you a list here of the exams themselves. And I mean, this is, I'm really apologize, this is so, so, so small and hard to read. This is actually in the handout as well already, in the papers that I, I'd written. So it's all in there, I believe. But I just wanted to give you an idea of these are the ones that we're focused on today. And it's really very North America focused, first of all. Um, and it's not by um, choice, it's really by a necessity. Because as you can see, it's already a really long list. Um, and adding the rest of the world to it makes it more challenging. And so one of our gauges, as I said before, is the scope of the exam. So some of these exams, like the CFA exam, for instance, is a, is a global exam. So that was, we focus on hard, hard, hard. But if they're not open, then we need to go somewhere else. Um, but again, we have the CFP, the CI, uh, CIIA, I mean, there's a ton of these here. And each of them has their own requirements. What's interesting is some of them um, recommend specific calculators or allow specific calculators explicitly, while some of them also just limit on functionality. So a good example of that would be the ACT or SAT, which are here in the US at the end of high school. They don't restrict based on calculator, they just restrict on functionality. So the good news is there, we don't have to try too terribly hard to go encourage them to add us, but what we do need to do is ensure that our product development doesn't limit us from being in those exams. And sorry, you had to you just You probably want to add the certified quantitative analyst. It's okay. about as big as the um, risk manager. Great, okay. And Quant those are very right. Certified quantitative, quantitative analyst. Analyst, CQA. CQA. Okay, great. Um, to add to your AP list, yeah. AP Bio and AP Environmental Science. Okay. Those have math components. Oh, great. Okay, that, super. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to steal the YouTube video after uh, after Eric's done <laughs> filming. I'm going to use these for my notes. So so consider it logged. But thank you very much. And uh, actually, let me repeat. It was the AP Environmental Science and, and biology. biology. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah, test. I'm sorry. The, the mental MCAT test. The MCAT. Okay. The EAT, the dental lab. I okay. Students, have oh, great. Okay. <laughs> So again, the, the point I was trying to make here is just basically that there are some exams for which we just want to avoid restricting ourselves. And then ultimately we just put their logo on the box and say AP and SAT approved. <coughs> but then there are others that have specific requirements that we have to meet. And we need to encourage and work with those agencies to really um, drive them to add our products to their list of products approved for the exam. And that's a, quite an uphill battle. As I said before, a lot of times we're fighting their security folks because they don't want to add any more than they have to. It's a little bit like an IT purchaser in an organization, right? Because they don't want to add more to the confusion than they have to. They like to keep a defined set of things that's static, so they don't have to keep reinventing the wheel, requalifying new things. And the same would apply here. So it's a bit of an uphill battle. One, because we don't necessarily know who the right people are to talk to in these, in these situations, and two, to convince them that they need to add our product. So I think, uh, to your point earlier, if we can start to define products that help them have benefits, treat them as a customer, essentially, the security person in an exam, that that might go a long way to helping us make sure we get included in those exams. But I just want to give you guys a, a flavor for, and for understanding why it is that we, don't, we aren't on every exam, 
uh, and what it would take, what, it, what we tend to look at to start looking at a specific exam and really driving hard if you get there. Um, and when you meet Laura later, hopefully she'll be here, um, she's actually really charismatic. And so she's actually going to be very good at the role of engaging with these groups and really trying to get